My name's Janie Stewart, and this is, uh, we're in my home in Ashland, Oregon. And like everybody, I'm old enough to have quite a long story. Uh, <laughs> so I moved to Tacoma in 1970 um, to join my friends there. I was at that point a single mom. My kid was almost three. and. Uh, I was ready to see the world be really different than it had been. And that was, of course, the Vietnam War and, and a lot of disenchantment in every direction. It so happened at that time that I had friends who had, friends in the Bay Area, who had moved to Magic Forest Farm. And uh, I went to visit them and kind of fell in love and decided that I wanted to stay. And I was very clear that being a single mom in Marin County was a difficult life. Very, just, I couldn't figure it all out. I couldn't figure out how to earn a living and raise my child and do, um, do all the things. And it looked so good to live with other people who would help you. Some people that would help you take care of your kid and people that would, you could produce together. and. Um, I felt like I moved really far away from civilization and I felt like we were reinventing the world. And really the place where we lived was only 20 minutes to down to the town of Cave Junction. But at that time, it seemed like it was hundreds of miles away. It seemed really remote. And I never left the farm for ages. I just stayed there. And I, I was a worker bee. I always was busy doing this or that important thing. To, for people to live communally, you have to make some agreements. You have to have some shared goals and you have to have shared goals, shared values, shared um, respect for each other's um, different ways of being and doing and thinking. and. Um, when we started out, how I got to the commune was not different than how many people did. So I had friends there and I went to visit and um, I had the first, the founders of the farm were friends of mine when I was a high school girl. By the time I went there, I was 25. So quite a bit of time had passed. That, that we stayed friends, but not in close contact. Then I had a, a one of my very good friends at the time in the in the uh, in the seven in 1969-1970 was a woman from the Bay Area who helped me. Um, she was just a good friend and really the person that showed me how to change a baby's diapers and how to know what to do when they cried and all check the safety pins. Um, so she, she was ready for a, a radical change in lifestyle and she moved to the, she went to meet the people at the farm and then eventually moved there herself. And then I went to visit her as well as these other people. And, um, one of the, and I was just thinking, I wasn't planning to move or, and I was just thinking about how to have my life be different. That was a hard time being separated and having a child that cries and whatever. So um, this person I was so fond of and close to, and one of the, and we only agree, we had lots of things we agreed about and we do today, but we were very different kinds of people. When I came, I was, it was in my personality to kind of make friends with everybody. Everybody, I, I was not a threatening person and not, um, not, I didn't overdo my opinions about things or I wasn't dogmatic and, um, 
so I was invited to stay. Uh, that was a big deal to be invited to stay. As the years went, and that was how the group formed, was whoever was there, loosely anyway, whoever was there could invite new people to come. And at the same time, there were people um, marching through Southern Oregon looking for land, looking for who they could join, and there was a, an assumption about in, there was an assumption about Tequilma out in the alternative community that there was free land there. And that wasn't really the case. What was really the case was the founders at Magic Forest Farm were an organized uh, intentional community group in the Bay Area before they came to Tequilma. And there were several other groups that, was, that had the same you know, had, they'd have meetings in Berkeley and organize, and they really tried, the earliest people, the people that came there in 68 and 69, thought they were coming with very clear intentions about how they would live, what they would share, how they would uh, build things, how they would educate their kids, very, um, and then, once they were there, they, you know, reality came and people came and needed things and wanted things and um, so and different factions emerged among the the group among the you know so if you were somebody that wanted to do a certain kind of work, you were m more likely to be able to stay and live there. There were people, there were some very creative artistic people who made the strong argument that it was just as valuable to paint a beautiful picture as it was to weed the onions. So the, there were huge amounts of political discussion, of, or it, not, I don't mean big global, I mean internal politics about how what you had to do to live there and who could live there. And we eventually, um, at some point, we reached a mass that you, there just was no more room for any more people. And at that point, we decided that we could tell people that they couldn't live there. And that was a huge, huge to go from anybody who wants to be there could be there to whoever we were, self-appointed we, um, could say, no, you can't live there. And it was, uh, it was complicated in the times because there were people who were saying no to somebody who really there was no difference in how they each arrived there. It was just, a, you know, more of a pooling of being this kind of person or that kind of person. And, and, uh, so, so who actually lived there evolved, and it was a rough evolution for a few years, but people, some very hurt feelings and some very angry people, and people asked to leave, and people uh, vibed out, and uh, just, it was not elegant. And it was a learning process, and over, um, by the, I'd say by the mid 70s, it was the, even by 72, 73, it was very clear. The direction we had become clear and evolved. But those first few years were really poorly defined and, and not handled very, people's feelings weren't handled very well and the structure was just vague. Not, nothing was written down to say these are the rules. It, it eventually did work. I mean, the the family is still connected. Absolutely, 50 years later, so that's like, right. Why was it so successful? How did it how did okay. it change so that it and adapt so that it was successful? You don't want, you don't want to sound like um, too groovy or anything. I don't. I'm not. I don't think. Of, but I think that the people who remained connected and who are here to kill my east, whatever, that were a core of people who 
had really profound respect for each other and um, a lot of love, uh, you know, in a not hippy-dippy way, just really appreciated uh, qualities in each other. I think um, well, there were plenty of conflicts and this person, you know, even as the years went by, it would change who was, you know, things worked and didn't work. I think the fact of having children together was very much of a, a bonding experience. I think we did some really hard things. I think the hardest thing we did was we shared money. And, and that was for me, that was really hard. And so we had to at least, we may not have loved it, but we had to at least practice a level of trust that, that uh, certainly not the American way, you know. <laughs> so that was hard. Um, some, some of the stronger personalities had really superb uh, highly res you know, values that you just had to really respect. Having Jim come and be, a, you know, help us form the medical uh, community was huge. We have very, and he, he's, as you said, he's a very not assuming person, but the fact of having that focus and feeling the, how good we were doing in the world, that really helped. Um, the co-op, the school, we had a school, we had the labor co-op, we had the clinic, um, we had some community land, we, you know, there were so many, and then all these various shared properties, uh, it, it held in different ways, and we're, so a lot of things to make us be integrated into each other's lives, and I guess I have to say it was just like a real real respect for one another. It wasn't so much traditional ritualized things, but we, we kind of invented rituals as we went along and we didn't, you know, you could question, was, was dressing like a hippie, was that a ritual? You know, and then some of the dresses, some of the thing, you know, where, you know, so we identified ourselves to the to outsiders by dressing similarly and um, sharing, uh, you know, that kind of thing. We didn't do thing. Well, we do like a parties for certain events, the solstice. The um, early on, we started doing there were a lot of people that. Um, with a Jewish background and we would do a Passover or this thing or that thing, but not the, uh, some places had like, actually even subgroups in the area s had certain ritualized things. We had things that I would say were tradition. We developed lots of tradition and uh, it maybe depends how you define ritual. We didn't have like uh, we didn't have uh, shamans and and drum you know things. But music groups emerged, drum groups emerged, and I just was remembering. In I think it would have been seventy two. In the early seventies, the women women's movement was taking off, and we didn't come to the rules of the women's movement quite by reading the newspaper because we didn't read the newspaper but eventually we figured you know we clearly were learning how to be um, individual uh, um, self-actualized whole people and uh, the women learned how to do so it almost became some of the things that the women were going to do almost became ritualized and uh, my friend and I used to come over here for a women's group because um, we we felt like we needed that stimulation and it was hadn't yet quite arrived there 
you know, and, and buy another year or so. It, it was there. So oh, I had so many things that were unspoken rules that might go to a little bit ritual, like how we made the bread, how we chopped the wood, how we, all that kind of, the things that we needed to do certainly were ritualized, but they weren't, um, you know, I don't know how to, they weren't um, church-like or, or that kind of thing. But I, I felt in myself and I felt among my friends that we were not, we didn't want to have um, burdensome leadership or cultish rules or that kind of, pretty individualistic. And uh, as some time went by, I had to, I, I, could, I figured out that I wasn't really the best communal person and eventually moved from Azure Forest Farm to another less communal um, but also shared property across the valley there and uh, kept my friends, stayed connected, <clears throat> and uh, lived more individually and less communally. In the process, I um, learned a lot of things. I learned carpentry skills. I learned working skills. I was very active with Green Side Up. I think you have some of that footage. Um, I'm very proud of being a, a part of the formation of a, an organization that allowed women to earn the same money as men. And it was very controversial back in the day. It wasn't, wasn't really eagerly accepted, at, at, especially at first, but it, you know, it took hold. And so I planted a lot of trees and I did a lot of organizational work. And um, that allowed me, a set of new, the, the organizational work allowed me to see a different set of skills that I could cultivate. I didn't know, I didn't think of myself as somebody that could do that kind of thing that well and became pretty effective. And um, then, well, years went by and by the mid 80s, I guess 15 years went by. I planted my first tree in 73 or 74 and I planted my last tree in 84 or 85. Um, but forming a labor co-op was a, a very idealistic thing to do. And I, I really grew in the process. I really learned about my own competence more. And then an opportunity came to earn money a different way. I needed to do something different. I was never a very strong tree planner anyway, but determined. And then uh, I needed more money. It was time for my kid to go to college. It was time to, <coughs> I was just aging out of physical labor. And an opportunity came to move over here to Ashland or to start working over here in Ashland and I, um, we, as I said, we worked on houses and repaired them and prepared them to sell and make some money. And it was a small group again, some, one of the people was one of the very same Magic Forest Farm people and another neighbor and whatever. So we got to continue in the tradition of everybody's work being valued the same way. and. Um, or equally and did quite well with that did you know made enough money to have a life and for years I tried to live in two places and boy that was hard you work all day and work all night and go home and work all day and all night some more um, and seeing that took kept us busy for a number of years and at that point I it, it became clear it was time to do the next thing, do something a little different than uh, painting and carpentry and whatever. It wasn't gonna work for me indefinitely. So it was time to go back to school. And uh, I had lived in San Francisco in the 60s and had three quarters of a degree 
completed, you know, or taken the coursework. Or, and I didn't have a very clear plan of what I wanted to do, but my intention was that I would find my, I needed a, a degree to be able to work in social services. And social services, sort of, you know, I think I was raised to grow up and work in social services, either that or teach. And uh, so when I went to explore what was possible, SOU was very generous and very friendly. And um, the person who the, the, the contact person I had helped me with looking at what I'd already done, what she, uh, I got my transcripts from the 60s, came in tiny little print, and, um, and fi we figured out what we could do. And uh, two, first of all, I got lots of credits for classwork that I'd taken, like community college things along the way, that I wasn't even going to count. I didn't even think they you know, like art classes and stuff. And then um, I got connected with the uh, sociology department because they were the most, uh, of the ways that I had different credits and stuff, that looked like the most accessible degree in the shortest amount of time. I think I was more interested in having the degree than I was in content of my education. I know I was. Um, so, one of the wonderful things that happened was I was able to have quite a few credits for writing up something about life, how, how a commune worked, how our communes worked, how, you know, they, for the sake of it being a, a, an academic project, I did some research about traditional communes and um, old, you know, the old Oneidas and those kind and then the new new ones and um, but they were very generous with accepting my expertise that I had just acquired by being there and uh, I don't remember anymore how many credits I got but I got a lot of credits for doing it. I had to learn how to use a computer that was really hard. <laughs> that was so hard. And things would happen. I, you know, I'd write up something and then I would lose it. I don't know where it went. It's still out there somewhere. <laughs> but, um, but so I inadvertently I learned how to do enough uh, technical work to make it last. I also had to wake Neil up sometimes in the middle of the night to save my paper or find it because I couldn't find it anymore. Um, anyway, I got, I was very happy to do that and in the process I made friends with a number of people in the sociology department at that time and they'd all be gone now They're all because they're my age. And there were um, four people there who had done, they, they were academics, but they had done a similar kind of lifestyle experience up here in, in um, off a dead Indian road somewhere. And um, then out of it all, one of the things that I did then for years was come back to some of the classes and talk to the class about, um, how come you, how they how they were formed how they grew what the, some of the issues were what was the difference between cult communes and charismatic leader communes and and the our group was very uh, we did not have leaders we didn't really welcome leaders somehow or everybody we didn't we didn't ever go that route of following somebody. It was not a very good, nobody was very interested in just following. So um, made lots of interesting ideas and interesting conflicts and interesting discussions, but it wasn't um, like the people whose children went off to wherever. And that was just not even a possibility. So, so then for years I did, I was able to 
make a contribution back to SOU by going in and talking to classes and stuff. And it was very flattering. You know, I, I appreciated getting to do that. And uh, the degree that I got, um, just having the, the goal of having the degree was what I needed to get to work into social services in uh, this community. And at that time, so that was, um, I think I got, I think I finished school in nine, 89, maybe, or 90. And um, almost didn't matter what degree I had, I was then able to find find work in social services. I just needed to, you know, to do all the pass audits and whatever. You just needed to have something. So my first job was at Dunhouse. My first um, job being an, having the great education that I had. And I was a volunteer coordinator. Um, I think it's an incredibly valuable social service. Um, and to the women who are um, survivors of violence, having a place to go is just huge. Having a place to feel safe. And um, it, it seemed like we were always full. There were always lots of people there. And in my naivety, I didn't, I, I tended to really, I started out really believing everything. I did, there were some funny stories where people just made up situations they were escaping from that they weren't really, they just were taking advantage of the services. So I didn't come into social services understanding the extent that um, people learn how to work the system. Um, but having, there were times that I felt like we did really save somebody's life. I have, I've had a pretty privileged life, so it wasn't in my own experience. And I think there was some value. I could be outraged on behalf, somebody's behalf, or be um, sympathetic on somebody's behalf, or look at their situation. I wasn't too close to it. I had, the, so some people that work in, especially in the field of domestic violence, are so triggered by reliving their own experiences and um, by my good fortune that wasn't my case at all so I could do uh, I felt like I could do really good work with people you know I met doctors wives I met policemen's wives I met um, lots of people that were on the lower echelons of society that were struggling couldn't leave because they couldn't you know, we're going to be able to buy milk for their kids, whatever. So I really, really learned a lot about how pervasive the the uh, issues were. And I think I did pretty well with helping people make logical, you know, try to, it was my nature to try to figure out a solution to a problem. Not everybody wants you to do that. and. Uh, you know, the longer I worked in social services, the better I understood that. But um, in the in the early times, we did meet somebody at Safeway and take them, um, you know, bring them to the house and make them swear to not telling their husbands. And uh, to, uh, had a little cloak and dagger aspect. Um, I think it did really help people to feel. I think. Probably the most helpful thing was the validating. You know, in, in the big picture, uh, people just needed some encouragement. They needed validation. They needed practical ideas like how to get money, how to get food stamps, how to close their sh clothe their children, that kind of thing. So, so on the physical aspect of providing shelter is obviously a huge issue today still for so many people and um, then adding in services and compassion uh, I think I think is a really important function um, 
boy did I learn about how organizations work <laughs> in that in that experience I was really naive because the organizations I'd worked with before um, were self-selected and this was um, I, I assumed a certain amount of autom autonomy and um, privilege of being able to decide what I wanted to do and how I would do it and all the, the and those maybe weren't the most use they weren't really the skills that that group at that time was looking for so much and one of the things it was a really an experience but one of the things that happened was the organization at that point in time had some um, very generous funding from a family who owned a, a, there's a beautiful house just down the road and the terms of the funding somehow the owner let the agency have it for I don't know a dollar a year or some t token amount but the man retained some kind of a voice on the board and a voice on the, in their operations and was very concerned that Dunhouse not in any way appear to be a radical organization and at that time um, at that time there was a national domestic violence coalition that was a very significant organization it was you know shaping laws and and uh, making the issues be very well understood by the public and there was a, a conflict about um, whether we could or could not belong to that organization and um, most of the staff wanted and felt like of course we should that's a way to be informed it's a way to know what's happening around the country way to have access to uh, legal information you know and I was I just talked the way I talk but I was very clear that I thought that that was a terrible idea to not be a member and um, somehow that got me that opinion got me identified with being a problem in the organization and uh, the, and this guy uh, had a lot of power he had a lot of money and people up the ladder in the organization really wanted access to the funds that he could provide so he got to run the show and they imported they brought in you know they brought in somebody who um, we were all pretty naive about HR laws and that kind of thing um, but he, they brought in somebody from California who understood the system you have a corrective action plan the person doesn't follow or whatever and in a matter of very short matter of time me and several other people were fired so that they could change over the situation to be more pleasing to the people that had potential money and it was a shattering experience for me and for several of the other people and uh, it, it was the kind of thing that if you're an innocent coming from the country and moving to the big city and wanting to help people and I mean I had nothing but good intentions and uh, I was just stunned I just didn't even know how I was going to get back on the horse and then you know things changed and I was able to move into another social service job that I I worked with adolescent girls for 20 years and uh, ran a program and did you know it was all that was ancient history but it was a very traumatic experience to come out of um, the innocence of just wanting to be a helper in the world to learning about how what underlying motives drive organizations um, and at that point 
one of the people from the, the college did some, some documenting of the story, the details of the story with um, another woman and me so that, and her goal was to educate people about how organizations work and uh, I, I don't know what became of that footage, but it was a you know it was a project she was going to work on, and she was a she was a, a terrific person, and I had to take a statistics class from her, the you know the previous year or two, and I really was not a good student, and she I was so it was just torture for me, and she was so she was like come on just you know. <laughs> You can do it, just do it, you know, and, what, and encouraged me. And somehow I made it through that class. And then, at, you know, with attribution theory, you don't like somebody that is making you do something you don't want to do. So then I got over it and did that. And I really liked her after, <laughs> after I didn't have to do statistics anymore. Do you want her name here? Sure. Cecile Burrell, you've heard of her? Yeah, well, she's a storehouse, and I would love to know if she's still around. I haven't seen her. So her, her people, so the people, if you want names, then the people who helped me, her, Ian Couchman, and my favorite person was Johnson, just a wonderful guy. And I know I see him once. I haven't seen him recently, but he's around still. But we've all got to be, I'm 75, so, you know, they're not working. But th so those guys were all very receptive to um, growing me up without turning me into an academic. <laughs> In, or they might have wanted to, but. <laughs> um, okay, so where can I, so from there I went to work at another organization and that was called Lithia Springs Girls Program and that grew then the years went by and ironically enough Dunhouse and the Lithia Springs programs merged and but by then things had changed it was not an issue and uh, I did I only needed to have a degree I didn't have a degree in adolescent psychology um, and you know, I was like a personality fit. I was able to feel really good about that job and really uh, grew and was very comfortable. And because it was so close, I didn't, um, I might have done better financially to have tried to ch move up the career ladder, but I loved working right here. I could be at work in one minute, you know, it was, uh, it was just great. And then uh, I also probably would have taken, continued some education, but I had uh, some pretty catastrophic health issues at, at the, um, in the early 90s. So it worked out great for me to just have a job that was right there and feel good about my clients and feel good about what I was doing. And I guess I have to thank SOU for giving me the, the piece of paper that made it so I could get the job.